Good morning, Peace United Church of Christ. I'm delighted to be joining you again today as we worship God in our homes and find different ways to find spiritual strength. My sermon title for today is Hints and Guesses. This is actually Good Shepherd Sunday. It's that day when we are called to read Psalm 23 and the first half of John 10, rather than this non-lectionary portion, which a UU colleague of mine once preached with the title, Getting Stoned with Jesus. But the 4 h -er in me wants more of God than what I have seen of American shepherds. So I kept reading through the Gospel of John and became intrigued with Jesus' use of the phrase, you are all gods which is a reference from Psalm 82. The psalmist, Asaph, imagines a black-robed judge of a Most High God who convenes a council of the Bene Elyon, the offspring of God, who are so unjust and wicked that they are cast down to die a mortal death. Asaph, stands in a long line of monotheistic Hebrews, but he lives in the company of people with an Egyptian Babylonian worldview, and so he speaks this word of judgment about the lesser gods of life. The gospel writer John loves symbolism and meaningful metaphors. The words he puts in the mouth of Jesus are dramatically different than the words Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Luke use. So Jesus, in this freewheeling retort to the judgmental monotheists of his day, snatches this phrase totally out of the Psalms context to defend identifying himself as the Son of God since we are all gods. These questioning Jews should be able to see the evidence of Jesus' holiness by the work he does. This logic doesn't please the Jewish elders and they seek to seize and stone him, but mysteriously, he escapes from their hands. Many varying God concepts are presented in this short passage. How is it you predominantly think of or imagine God? At some level, we each have a concept of God as a supernatural being. Those are the omnipresent, omnipowerful images where God is bigger and brighter and better than our best superhero. For many, God is essentially that Michelangelo image reaching across a blue sky to animate Adam. This is the God of the Lord's Prayer, a Father who is distant and above. There are times we can't help but concretize this mysterious other with names like Father, Mother, or Shepherd. Identities which mostly put a meaningful label on the otherwise enigmatic. This, however, is the God atheists and artists and the injured push against because of the abuse associated with unbridled power. Alongside this tradition is the God whom Paul identifies in Athens as the one in whom we live and move and have our being. This God as energy, God as spirit, God as all-pervasive, is the God of Psalm 139, whom David cannot escape by ascending to the heavens or by making his bed in Sheol. This is not the supernatural God of theism, but the ever-present, transcendent, yet imminent God of panentheism, a phrase which comes from the Greek, pan meaning everything, in, theos, God, or God as more than everything, 
yet everything in God. Changing the Lord's Prayer to Our God in whom is heaven, hallowed be your name. When Moses encounters the holiness of the burning bush, he speaks into the mystery, asking, What is your name? God's response in Hebrew is the breath, Eye, Asher, Eye, which we have typically translated as I am, who I am. But the verb is both more dynamic and elusive than that, and Martin Buber translates the passage with the energy and immediacy of I will be present as I am present. Moses experiences and knows this God who is present with, around, and through him. In the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John, when Jesus is concluding his farewell address, he, he speaks again and again of knowing God, saying at one point, this, knowing God, is eternal life, that we know God. Knowing God in the experiential sense is a mystical encounter as we are pulled from our present and immediate consciousness into a holy moment. It can happen in many circumstances. William but Butler Yeats, the Irish poet, describes such an incident in his poem, Vacillation. My 50th year had come and gone. I sat a solitary man in a crowded London shop, an open book and empty cup on the marble tabletop. While on the shop and street I gazed, my body of a sudden blazed, and 20 minutes more or less it seemed so great my happiness that I was blessed and could bless. Leslie Weatherhead, an English pastor and theologian of the 1900s, wrote of a numinous experience he had aboard a train. For a few seconds, I suppose, the whole compartment was filled with light. This is the only way I to know to describe the moment, for there was nothing to see at all. I felt caught up in some tremendous sense of being within a loving, triumphant, and shining purpose. I never felt more humble. I never felt more exalted. The most curious but overwhelming sense possessed me and filled me with ecstasy. I felt that all was well. All human beings were shining and glorious beings who in the end would enter incredible joy. These experiences of being blessed and seeing the glory of God in others is at the heart of Jesus' challenge to us to love God and love our neighbor as ourselves. When we diminish the life of another, we are diminishing an expression of God's glory. We honor God when we honor another human. We expand the presence and power of God when we do what Jesus calls good works. It is the evidence of his healing powers, of his works and deeds of love and mercy that Jesus offers to his accusers of his witness of his bond with God. Here is where the mystical meets the ethical in the constructs of Christianity. We are not wooed into God's presence so that we might be personally saved or emotionally exalted. We are pursued by the hound of heaven 
so that in our blessing, we might bless and nourish another. It is no accident that Jesus, the doer of good works, could so quickly call Psalm, call Psalm 82 to mind, as it says, in the midst of the gods, Adonai holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the orphan. Maintain the right of the lowly and the destitute. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. This remains our calling every day of our lives, even in this time of isolation. When we are courageous and charitable, when we are loving and trustworthy, when we are in the right place doing the right thing, God is present, expanding the sacred space, the energy that flows from every act of kindness. We have at best, as T.S. Eliot writes, only hints and guesses about the nature and being of God, the Holy Other. But what we have beyond those hints and guesses are prayer and silence, observation, discipline, thought, and action. Eliot's reminder is that the hint half-guessed the gift, half understood, is incarnation. God in Christ, Christ in God. God in us, each of us in the God in whom we live and move and have our being. The God who is made known to us in the breaking of bread, in the service of others, in the sanctity of our homes. May that God be with us always. Amen.